This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining me today. We have Richard and John and friend of the show, Nicholas Wildstar, is back to talk about his campaign for governor. Nicholas, you are a continual campaigner, shall we say. How's this campaign for governor, this recall election campaign, been different than, say, the normal campaign for governor? Well, this one is getting a lot more attention, that's for sure, than my previous campaign for governor. When I ran in 2018, I was widely ignored by the media. Um, but this time around, I'm getting quite a lot of exposure. I just got an exclusive in um, Sacramento B, Fresno B, since I'm a Fresno local. Um, I've also gotten an exclusive by KC, your Central Valley News, Newsweek um la times the list goes on and on so it's um a a lot more high profile i would say (laughs) of a campaign and um i'm getting of course a lot more support from the people of the community because of that um increased awareness and um hopefully that ends up translating to more votes come election day you're running on, I, I just got my ballot in the mail the other day, and you're running on the uh, Republican byline as opposed to the Libertarian byline. What's up with that? I'm running as a Ron Paul Republican. So I'm taking that message of Libertarianism to a larger stage. Um, that's the one thing about me running as a Libertarian is, and speaking with the public, I was just pretty much disregarded simply because I was running as a third party candidate. Oh, it's a wasted vote, or you guys never win. And um, but this time around, I'm not getting any of that type of pushback whatsoever. The minute I say I'm running as a Republican candidate, I, you got my vote instantly, just like that. So um, there's less reluctance in getting support from the voters because of that tribalism. Uh, unfortunately, it's just a matter of playing into that for the greater good. So if we want to have an opportunity to advance the principles of liberty, then we um, must adopt. And so I'm again, pretty much um, uh, what I would say, uh, (laughs) bogarting and uh, coming on the scene to inform more of the Republicans about why um, libertarianism would benefit them uh, with them going through this identity change, you know? Well, obviously, ideologically, you're a libertarian. And and so, uh, ostensibly, is Larry Elder. And and then, of course, there's a libertarian candidate on, on the ballot, Jeff Hewitt. Uh, well, how do you feel about the uh, libertarian vote being split three ways? Uh, I think we can all agree that uh, Newsom needs to go. But what about splitting the libertarian vote? Well, it's not a matter of splitting anybody's vote. I mean, we are all independent-minded voters. So when we go to vote, we should be voting on voting and supporting the candidate that best represents our values and principles. We should always be voting that way, no matter what the person's um, political party affiliation may be. So um, there's people that feel that same way in the Republican Party, that feel like they need to all ban, you know, behind one candidate in order for them to win. But this is different than a primary election. You don't have to win by majority, per se. So you don't have to feel so pressured to, um, again, all, you know, uh, band behind one candidate. This is a win by plurality with this special election. So voters of California will be asked two questions. One, would you like to recall Gavin Newsom? And two, you know, who would you like to replace him with? So the candidate that gets the most votes on question two ends up becoming the next governor. And um, it's already been projected that that could easily happen with, you know, one to two million votes. So um, that, again, is the reason why more people should be focusing on what the candidates are offering to do and what their campaign proposals are opposed to party affiliation. If you're voting just like that, then you're wasting your time and mine. What are the issues that you're finding that resonate most with uh, your voter base? Um, the government overreach, definitely more than anything, especially with them promoting more, um, mandates for masks due to the coronavirus crisis or, you know, the, um, MRNA injections, AKA COVID vaccinations. 
um, as well as the passports and, you know, proof to uh, go in and out of places, you know. So that seems to be the biggest issue. A lot of people feel like that's the biggest infringement on their personal liberties is just being forced to adhere to those requirements. Um, so, of course, I'm against all of that. And as governor would ban any such requirement in the state, um, but also our economy as well. People are suffering um, economically, you know, due to the job losses, due to the businesses closing and et cetera. So I want to, of course, jumpstart our economy by making sure we keep our money in our pocket instead of letting government redistribute our money with stimulus packages as they've been doing now. Um, so my uh, goal is to cancel cancel uh, collection of all taxes for the next year for all income earners in the state. That way we can again um, get our economy going where it matters the most and that's the working class people of the state. The, to get our economy going is we're going to have to stop firing people for not getting vaccinated, right? We have a story here on uh, in Houston is having a nurse shortage. Well, after they fired 150 nurses because they wouldn't get vaccinated. And right. here we're talking about these nurses who worked through the, the high rage of the pandemic and now all of a sudden they're tossed aside because mm -hmm. they chose not to get a shot. And yet now we're complaining because we don't have enough nurses and we don't have enough workers or there's a worker shortage that people are complaining. You know, are you, do you all realize the, the consequences of your decisions? I mean, it's like there's no long-term thought through these processes. You don't think that if we fire workers because they're not vaccinated that we're not going to have enough workers to fill the job or that people, if we're going to require vaccine passports, people are going to stop going to restaurants and then all these restaurants are going to close and, you know, all these various issues. Do they, does anybody think these things through and how do we change that mindset? Well, I'm, I'm a little bit I'm torn on this one because I think, uh, quite frankly, if you own and run a business that, that uh, you know, you, you contract with the people that work for you and you, it's like this thing, you know, people want me to wear a mask to go in the coffee house. It's their business. They could, they could ask that I wear a tutu to go into their coffee house. And, and if I didn't want to wear a tutu, I'd go to the coffee house that lets me wear my tights. Not that I wear either one, occasionally running tights. But, you know, the idea that, that there, yes, there is, there are unintended consequences, but uh, it's a business's right to, to create whatever relationship with its workers that it wants to have. And if it wants to have all of its workers vaccinated with COVID, then it pays the consequences of workers leaving that, uh, that uh, aren't vaccinated and it attracts workers uh, to its place of business who want to be in a 100% vaccinated environment. So I see, I, I don't have a problem with it. And I don't understand why people get so upset when, when a business uh, does something that a business should be able to do. Well, it's because these businesses are having their arms twisted by the government mandates. The government mandated that the these healthcare workers get vaccinated. It wasn't necessarily the business themselves. They're being pressured. That, that, that I have a problem with. I have a problem with, with government mandates. I don't have a problem with businesses choosing to do that. And, and I guess uh, uh, Governor Grusin, uh, whatever silly name we want to call him, has decided that all healthcare workers um, in California need to be vaccinated. I, right. I tell you what, it's not going to happen. Uh, the, the, because uh, a while back I was chatting with one of my doctor buddies and and he said that uh, they felt very, very good in his organization because 80% of the physicians had chosen to be vaccinated. I also know that a much lower percentage of nurses in that environment have chosen to be vaccinated. And in the state of California, the nurses uh, union is, um, you know, they're strong and then there's Olympic strong. Well, there's nurses union strong above that. So the idea that, that you're going to fire in the state of California, I don't know, 30,000 nurses and 10,000 health techs and 6,000 doctors for not getting vaccinated, not going to happen. Uh, but the uh, fact that they're imposing that mandate says that they don't care. You know, yeah. Grusom is really, you know, putting people's livelihoods on the line by saying that, hey, either you 
adhere to these new requirements or you're fired essentially. And it, you know, um, these people won't have an opportunity to collect any unemployment, any type of, you know, assistance were they to lose their job. Um, of course they don't, they lose access to any, you know, severance packages or pension payments that they would have had received if they were to retire. Um, so it's definitely a threat to people's opera, uh, you know, um, chance to earn a living for themselves and they should never have, have that, um, be put over their heads by government officials, which is why, again, it needs to be banned from any public requirement and, you know, any public place, private businesses, like you said before, Hey, that's your own business. And if you end up having to suffer job loss because of that, or, you know, loss of income due to lawsuits, et cetera, then, you know, you should have made better business decisions, uh, decisions. But as far as, um, the government is concerned and what their requirement for state employees, that definitely should not be a requirement and we shouldn't be supportive of that at all. Well, so you know, what I find that it's really fascinating about this whole uh, vaccination requirement thing is that uh, up until a couple of days ago, none of the viruses had received full FDA approval. There was a provisional approval for, for uh, Moderna, for several of them. Uh, and just uh, a couple of days ago, Pfizer got its full approval. Uh, and it's been the progressives in the past who have argued that we need to prevent any uh, medicine from coming on the market unless it receives full FDA approval. Now the progressives are arguing, or had been arguing, that well, uh, even though it doesn't have full FDA approval, you must get it. Now, I, I'm not a big fan of FDA approval in the first place. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, making sure that it doesn't do any damage might have a place in public policy. But proving efficacy, that's a whole nother ball game and very, very difficult to do because you got to prove a negative. Uh, and uh, I've, I've gotten my, my two jabs uh, online for the third since I'm, you know, in a place where and of an age where I can get that third jab uh, fairly quickly. But uh, as far as the, uh, the, the, the hypocrisy of, of uh, the progressives, on the one hand, arguing that uh, you have to have full approval before you can take a medicine, and now you must take a medicine even though it's not fully approved, is uh, uh, hypocritical, to say the least. I, yeah. I'm doing it. The, the, the idea that, that uh, anybody would think that the progressives are morally uh, or logically consistent in any way, uh, really, and these people can vote. It, that's, that, that's, uh, I'm they not do. talking about that's the scary. progressives, but in, I'm talking about the, the people who uh, give them validity. And there's nothing consistent about their logic or their argument. And they, it's still, I'm going to do this every time until you tell me to stop. Let's not call them progressives. What they want to do is regress to the centralized power uh, that kings had, the power of star chambers, where the government elites are immune from everything and control every single part of life. How is that freaking progress? Let's think of another name for them. Let's just call them the idiots. And, and <laughs> I like regressives. That definitely is fitting. <laughs> they, they, are, they are regressive, if anything, not progressive. And I just hate it when we call them that. Like call them liberals. You look up the term liberal. Well, yeah, well, liberal. I mean, the, the word liberal has been compromised too. It used to be a good thing. Yeah, Classic no, liberal. they're more so illiberal. That's, that's yeah, liberals came from the root word of liberty and. Since when is the modern liberal, liberal, air quotes on all that, actually care this squat about actual liberty? It's, it's nothing. The my body, my choice crowd no longer cares about my body, my choice. It's, it's kind of by the concept that we kind of notice. You mind Let's if I add something to what Richard said before we move on? No, please. About the FDA requirement, because this uh, COVID uh, vaccine, this shot, uh, is being administered under emergency use authorization but now since the pfizer shot has been approved they can require it and in the state of california we already have laws under sb 276 and 277 that would you know um again 
in, include this new approved um, Pfizer shot in those state requirements. So that's why as governor, I would nullify SB 276 and 277. But go yeah. ahead. Yeah, many of us fought these yeah. those kind of overreach when they first caught it. It says, you know, it's we're not dealing with polio here. It's not polio. It's, the, you know, we're, yeah, it's just, ah, we, we've gone so far over the rail. But talking about going over the rails, we're going to move on here a little bit. Um, the governor's office has been kind of caught playing with PG&E shall we say, uh, here in town, the local TV station here in town has done an expose on the relationship between Governor Newsom and the PG&E and how much he got the PUC to run interference and how they essentially, when that, the big fire a couple years ago that PG&E was responsible for, he had, they essentially got them the bailout and that was all done kind of behind the scenes. And the fact is, as we know, this this corruption runs so deep. Frozen. How it works. So, yes, that's the problem. That's <laughs> the fact that this is how it works is the fundamental problem. How do we deal with these structural issues, Nicholas? Well, it's interesting. Uh, the, the the law firm hired by Newsom to write the legislation that exempts uh, PG and E from being prosecuted. Uh, because they have a fire certificate. The fire certificate says, oh, hey, we're doing everything right uh, now. And so they can't be prosecuted for the crimes that they were prosecuted before and found guilty of, of killing, what was it, 84 people in, in, in a fire a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't be prosecuted on, on those kinds of things uh, in the future. It's, it's sort of like the vaccine makers. They can't be uh, held liable if their vaccine screws up, if, if it uh, has... Uh, bad side effects. Now, PG&E can't be held liable if, oh, hey, the spark caused a fire from our uh, transmitter or whatever, or our, our transformer. Uh, it's the large, well-protected, well-lobbied, well-lawyered up large corporations that don't have to worry about liability while all of the rest of us do have to worry about liability for bad actions. They're protected. And coincidentally, PG&E was one of Newsom's very large campaign contributors. How about that? I'm sure, of course, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. But what's what's uh, <laughs> what's even worse is is some of the skullduggery behind the scenes. The the head of the the PUC, I believe, at the time, who's no longer there, fired for something or other, uh, was told to sign the certificate uh, and. Uh, in hindsight, said uh, I shouldn't have signed it, even being told to. That uh, the findings on the part of the commission did not agree with uh, uh, issuing the certificate. Basically, the, the governor's office put it down in front of her and said, "You will sign this." So, um, and I'm sure it's all just a coincidence that there yeah. there are there are other major government-sponsored monopolies that haven't contributed to... Oh, wait, no, there aren't. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Anyway, How about this coincidence with the French Laundry dinner, you know, that the, that PG&E executive and um, his friends at that law firm were attendees at, as well as Poseidon Water executives and uh, Perkin Elmer executives. That's the company that was cherry-picked to... Um, handle these vaccination centers. So there's a lot of lobbying going on by Gavin Newsom and the, the people in Sacramento. And the legislators are also included in that. I think when we talk about accountability, we not only need to look at um, Newsom as being, of course, someone that was involved, but all of those legislators that gave it the green light. And Kevin Kiley is one of them. He's running for governor. And um, he's a, an assembly member that signed off on that bill, AB 1054, which uh, gives the, out those safety certificates to uh, PG&E. So when we talk about bad actors involved, we the people need to go down the list of holding every responsible individual accountable for their actions. And we shouldn't be giving them the um, uh, simply the benefit of the doubt because of their celebrity or because of their position or 
connection or status or whatever the case may be. It's a matter of getting rooting out those um, special relationships that have, again, defrauded the people of California and put us in an even worse situation if we had a responsible government. Yeah, the Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex, but what we're finding out is that industrial complex exists at all levels of government, whether it's the PUC, whether it's the homeless, homeless uh, issues, the grift. We, you know, some call it the, the, you can call it the grifting game, you can call it the industrial complex. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of people making a lot of money on all these government programs, and except the people they're supposed to help. Right. It's, you know, we have all these government programs that are supposed to help people, but everybody but the recipient is actually the ones getting help. What was it? Yeah. A few yeah. in, in addition to military, add education, add health care, add, in this case, uh, uh, public uh, electrical utilities and gas utilities. There's, all, you know, and really uh, any large corporation just about can be added to the list of people who have a cozy relationship with governor. Uh, I think it's really instructive that uh, uh, Jeff Bezos is uh, suing uh, uh, the federal government to get the space contract that Elon Musk won fair and square, simply because he doesn't like the outcome. And he yeah, is a big contributor. Billion dollars because of it. And you know, and then used it to go to space on our dime, you know? Why are we um, shareholders in his company? You know, since we bailed him out, we should be owners, part owners in that company. Well, but to be fair, we didn't bail out Amazon, but yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> All right, where's our yeah, money? I mean, Elon's, Elon's been making hay with, uh, with government. Uh, um, oh, he gets plenty of his own subsidies too, yeah. And yeah, so all, these, all these guys are complaining. Yeah. He's, he's, he's brilliant at getting tax space of, got for the NASA and that's still the problem yeah uh oh did we freeze up on somebody no we're waiting for you to moderate there uh, James. oh <laughs> well, so I, I thought everybody kind of froze up there for a second <laughs> I mean well, I could go on I'm sure <laughs> no 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 we'll move on to some fires I'm sitting here breathing in some fire smoke and we find out that Governor Newsom uh, we're back to Governor Newsom misleading the public about well, the kind of the issues he did with fires. I mean, we covered this a few weeks back, but now that you're here, we want to cover this. How do you actually deal with this kind of issue where we have a governor and his staff and, you know, the bureaucratic mechanisms underneath them that encourage or even allow this type of malfeasance where you can sit here and he can go up on say, go up and sit there and say, yeah, we've accomplished all this, you know, $6 million or whatever he says he spent, but he actually only spends a fraction of it and they didn't even spend it on anything that's useful. So how do we actually start spending money usefully and actually holding people accountable? How do well, we get that transparency? Regardless of who you're going to vote for in the recall to be governor, absolutely we should vote to get Newsom the hell out of the governor's uh, chair. That's a start. Uh, one of the interesting things is the California progressives or as re regressives as uh, John likes to call them, but back in the early 1900s, they actually were progressives. They uh, put on the ballot, uh, made, made it possible for Californians to, to recall and also a petition uh, for uh, uh, getting uh, stuff on the ballot as a referendum. So the referendum and the recall, very progressive in the true sense of the word uh, uh, actions. And now the so-called progressives of today, the regressives of today are complaining about the progressive uh, recall. We need to embrace actual progressivism uh, and recall Governor uh, Governor uh, Newsom and uh, and vote for Nicholas, vote for Jeff, vote for Larry, whoever you prefer, but vote for somebody to get and, and you know. But first of all, vote uh, yes on the recall. Right. Yeah, and that's I second that. And one you know one of the the benefits of parliamentary and elections is you can vote no confidence. Uh, you can the, the 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 people can vote no confidence in their leadership and they have to declare a new election. Now, in this country with all the, the strife, it might be a good idea. I was thinking it was a bad idea because we'd constantly be having elections, but maybe if we did that, it would keep them for, away from their desks where they can spend these exorbitant amounts of money 
padding the pockets of their friends. So, you know, that's that's one piece of the English style of voting that I do like. This this is basically a vote of no confidence in current leadership. And and I do love that and, and support it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, across the board, the people of California will vote to get them out. I actually got an email from a concerned voter sharing that um, that ABC expose saying that she was a Democrat and a, a Newsom supporter in 2018, and she will be voting yes on the recall, a hard yes. Um, and once more people pay attention to his failures, especially with the wildfires, I mean, since that also pours into other issues like with the drought and, you know, the water shortages and, of course, government failures altogether um, because he does have a prosperity. He does have a responsibility and he just didn't do his job. So first and foremost, we need somebody in there that's going to do their job and be honest with the people, not say that, you know, so much money was spent and then only find out a fraction of it was spent or say 90,000 acres was, you know, managed and only 12,000 acres were managed, um, you know, things like that or expanding government like what he did with the um cal fire when he first got elected to supposedly deal with wildfires but yet there hasn't been any type of a control over the issue so um it's a lack of leadership definitely gavin newsom is a clear and present danger not just to california but to the entire country i was in colorado uh, a couple of weeks ago up in the mountains in colorado the state of colorado issued uh, a, a bad air uh, warning why California wildfire smoke had drifted as far as Colorado. Mm. And that's if you if you drill down on the numbers, uh, Gavin got a couple billion dollars to uh, to fight fires. And instead of spending the money on on, you know, fire prevention, thinning forests, controlled burns and all the rest of that, which he actually did less of than uh, back in, I think, the Brown administration. Uh, less this year and last year, despite the fact that we knew we were going to have horrible droughts. Um, what he did was spend it up on uh, spend it uh, beefing up uh, employees in Cal Fire. Why? Because employees in Cal Fire pay union dues that right. goes to support who him. So uh, you know, the more public employees that there are with those big fat pensions and the big fat paychecks, the, the, the bigger the union dues, they go directly into his pocket. Exactly. And that's why that relationship between government officials and the special interest groups like the unions and lobbyists and pharmaceutical companies or whatever the case may be, needs to be separated. Um, there's actually a, um, a piece of legislation called the Anti-Corruption Act that was created by a bunch of constitutional scholars and professors, et cetera, uh, that I plan on signing into law once I'm elected governor to separate that big money interest over politics. Um, but with regards to addressing wildfires, we definitely need to expand those control burn practices um, like, like what John was bringing up and also to also um, basically allow community logging as well. You know, people coming in, being, you know, uh, responsible, you know, in cleaning up the forest lands that are, um, have experience in doing such a thing. You know, you have uh, independent logging companies that would love to have access to some of those forest lands, but because money plays another, in, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, another interest in it. Um, they want to make sure that that wood isn't being used to make money for those businesses. But if anything, that that's what we should be promoting in uh, in government. You know, is more job opportunities, more ways for the people to create an income for themselves just off of the natural resources that are available to us all. all right, and with that, we have got to go. We are out of time. Thank you, Nicholas, for joining us. We gotta thank you all for, for joining us from uh, Team Counterpoint here. <laughs> thank you, and please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show in Sacramento. 
Channel 17 on Comcast. Each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.